As a present to myself for finishing the migration installation, I finally got a collet chuck for my lathe. I love these speedy models, very possibly because that's what I learned on at the UW student shop. This is a collet for it. This kind is a 5C, but there are a bunch of other types. My mill uses R8, for instance, and ERs are also very popular. Put a letter next to a number and it's probably a type of collet. You might have used a smaller one in a router or a much smaller one in a Dremel tool. If it has jaws that close by being pulled down into a taper, that's a collet. I already had a cheap set of 5Cs for my collet blocks, so I figured I would just stick with that style. They're supposed to be better at holding shallow pieces of stock anyway, unlike ERs, which are really intended for holding tooling with a long shank. Why bother with collets, you might be asking? There are definitely some disadvantages, which is why I hadn't bothered until now. The range of size each can hold is quite limited, so you need a lot of them to be useful, which quickly gets expensive even with cheap imports. But they can be very precise and repeatable, like a four-jaw chuck, while still being really fast to use, unlike a four-jaw chuck. They're great for close-up work on small pieces, as the chuck doesn't have any projecting jaws to tear your fingers off. They're able to hold threads without damaging them, unlike the toothy jaws of most scroll chucks. They can hold shapes other than cylinders, such as square or hexagonal stock. You can even get emergency collets, which aren't hardened or made of brass or plastic, letting you machine a custom collet for any weird shape you need. So, if I was getting serious about my collets, I'd need a place to keep them. Rattling around in this box in the mill cabinet wouldn't cut it anymore. Luckily, I have this metal filing cabinet next to the lathe, and its drawers are just deep enough for a 5C collet. Some experimentation led me to a simple design of plywood, with rabbits cut on either side to hold it in place, while the middle rests on the central spine of the drawers. Ironically, I didn't have the proper collet for the router table to hold the straight cut bits I happened to have, so I had to use an end mill instead. Worked okay. My original plan was to drill holes in which the collets would sit directly. Unfortunately, 5C collet shanks are one and a quarter inches, and thus using a hole saw of that size results in holes just slightly too small for the collets. The next step up I had, one and three eighths, is way too wide. I first experimented with sanding out the one and a quarter holes to get a nice sliding fit, but someone on Mastodon suggested 3D printed inserts instead. That way I could drill at 1 and 3 eighths and not worry about it. Plus, it should look a lot slicker. A day of trial and error led me to this design. A nice bonus, by building the 10 degree taper of a 5C into the collar, it meant they could be held much more positively than in a punched metal rack. No rattling. I also figured some open boxes at the front to hold collet blocks and related equipment might be nice. After failing to find any commercially available containers of the right size, I decided to try one of the laser cutting services. I used this website to design the cut files, sent them off, and soon I had some perfectly functional basic boxes in exactly the right size. I didn't even bother gluing them, the fit was so good. While printing many batches of collars, eight at a time, I could finally assemble the racks. I didn't like the chip out I was getting in the experiments, so I tried drilling pilot holes and then using a hole saw from each side. As an added bonus, that way it made the plugs much easier to remove between each hole. I still wanted to sand them after drilling, and I wasn't sure how to efficiently do that, until I remembered the cone mandrel I made for forging all the tentacle suckers on my visitor sculpture back in 2015. With some sandpaper glued on and mounted in the lathe, in a collet of course, it made the job much easier. I decided to go with two drawers' worth to allow for future expansion of the collection. A full set of fractionals is already 72 collets large, and that's before getting into metric. And then there are the square and hexagonal ones to consider. My collection has already tripled in size during the filming of this video, now that I'm actively looking for good deals on the regular sites. As someone once said, once you get locked into a serious drug collection, the tendency is to push it as far as you can. I still ended up having to sand some of the collars wider, annoyingly, but I've updated the model to make the throat a bit wider. A link is in the description if you want to print your own set. These could actually make for an interesting injection molded product if someone wanted to take that on. So now I had a collet chuck, the beginnings of a decent collection of collets, and a flashy new rack to keep them in. What was left? Well, I started thinking about collet blocks. As I've said many times before, I freaking love these things. Immensely useful things, collet blocks. A recent discovery. They're great for holding short screws that you need to cut to length on the bandsaw. 
There is something so elegant yet brute force about the concept. Need to index things in factors of 2, 3, 4, or 6? Boom, done. No math, no thinking, no abstractions. They're so nominal. And yet, I want to be able to index other divisions of the circle. I don't really need to, but I want to. Well, I could at least fill in some holes by making new collet blocks with unorthodox numbers of sides. A pentagonal and heptagonal pair, at least. First I did the lathe work, boring out the central hole and then cutting the taper. To get this as accurate as possible, I used a 10 degree angle block and indicated the compound taper against that. In the process, I had to rebuild the compound and then the tailstock and then realign the tailstock, but it all worked out in the end. Then I moved to the mill. I put a 1 inch collet in the new block and held some 1 inch cold roll with that. This could then be held by the 3 jar on my indexing head for the milling of the sides of the collet block. Of course, the presence of an indexing head means this whole thing is a bit silly. I can index by any factor under 360 using that thing. But it's big, a pain to set up, and easy to mess up when using it. It's certainly a good tool to have, it just lacks the, the raw majestic minimalism of a collet block. The final step was adding the dog point set screws. See, 5C sockets have a backup retention pin of some kind that runs in a slot along the side of the collet. This way, should the taper friction be overcome, the collet can't spin out of control in place. That could easily mess up the precision ground taper on them or their socket, which is generally frowned upon. A dog point is just a set screw that is turned down at the business end to ride in a slot like that. Unfortunately, I didn't have any. But I did have normal set screws and a collet chuck. Before, I would have had to chuck up a piece of scrap, then drill and tap a very shallow hole in it for the set screw to be held by. Much easier now. With the pentagonal and heptagonal blocks made, I could now index by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Better, but still not good enough. Do you ever get a weird obsession of thinking that something should be possible, even though it probably isn't? My brain fell into this trap of insisting there should be some way of combining collet blocks together like gauge blocks, stacking up enough prime divisors to index by any value needed. That idea got firmly stuck in my head, and for days I was circling around it endlessly while in the mentally liminal spaces of bus trips and drifting off to sleep in showers. Sadly, I'm pretty sure my brain is wrong. It really isn't possible. But it did lead me to an interesting idea. See, with a hexagonal block, you can actually index by 2, 3, 6, and 12. Kind of. Because one of its factors is odd, you can index the block either with a flat side down and two vertices against the vice jaws, or you can put two flat sides against the vice jaws and have a single vertex sitting at the bottom. This doesn't quite count though because it changes the height of the axis of the part being held. For a lot of operations that would be a problem, but it can still be useful for say drilling holes or cutting flats on the sides with an end mill. You can't do it with the square collet block, though, because you'd have vertices on all sides and lose the strict clocking. Without flat faces to mate with the static jaw datum of the vise, it'll end up at some random angle in the vague vicinity of what you want. No good. But, what if you had a little 45 degree angle shim in which the point of the collet block could rest? That would firmly hold the angle, and you'd be able to index eight sides. Even better, if it was the right thickness, it could be used to lift up the collet block when indexed normally, leaving the axis at the same height for both modes of use. The same idea applies trivially to the pentagonal block, bringing my indexable factors up to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, and sort of 12. I wasn't going to make an undecagonal collet block for 11 or a heptagonal angle shim to give me 14. That's a bit silly even for me. But what about 9? A full run from 2 to 10 sure would be nice. I could have just made a nonagonal collet block, obviously, but I was still intrigued by the angle shim approach. So far, this had only divided a division by 2, which, not being a factor of 9, wouldn't help in this case. But what about an angle shim designed to divide a division by 3 instead? Combined with the 3 indexing of the hexagonal block, that would give us the elusive 9. Unlike the previous ones, this shim couldn't be symmetrical, but I still would only need a single shim because it could be flipped around to work in the other direction. The indexing process would be hexagonal block with a flat pointed down, then rotated to fit in the angle shim in this orientation, 
then rotated to fit in the angle shim flipped around the other way, then back to a flat down again. As before, the thickness of the shim is designed to keep the axis height steady if you use it as a spacer when the block is flat side down. So that's my recent descent into the world of collets. I'm not really sure the angle shim idea is a significant addition to the state of the art, particularly in an era of cheap digital indexing heads. And I'm highly doubtful I'm even the first person to think of it, though I sure don't know what the official term for such a thing would be. In the end, just being able to directly index any value from 2 to 10 will have to be satisfaction enough for me. No, there's more coming, just waiting for a siren. Ooh. Emphatic siren. <laughs>